and uh, welcome everybody uh, to today's uh, CM2 service and maintenance uh, webinar. And before we get started, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming uh, and joining us here on this beautiful day. And as we know, uh, with this controvirus, we're starting to see uh, a, little, a coronavirus, excuse me. We're starting to see a little more light at the end of the tunnel and hopefully within the near future, everybody will be doing hands-on at our academy in uh, Warwick, Rhode Island. With that being said, we saw all the good that was happening in the world, then we saw a little bad, and as a team, we can all work together to get through all of this uh, that we're going through uh, today. With that being said, uh, we're gonna get started today on the Vita Cross of CM2 service and maintenance uh, presentation. So today's, uh, what we're gonna be uh, going over is uh, why we need the uh, uh, annual maintenance or how to do the annual maintenance and why we should be doing this. So we're gonna go over what uh, recommendations out of the manual that they use uh, for cleaning solutions as well as tools and uh, what steps are taken in uh, going through all these different steps. And I had reached out to all the service technicians that we do have, including our service tech department. So they all put it, gave us a hand on putting this one together uh, with some feedback, uh, as well as uh, thank the POTS people, because you'll see I put uh, some part numbers on here as well. So little uh, uh, collaboration from everybody on this one here. And hopefully uh, you pick up a few things uh, through this presentation. And uh, by all means, ask all the questions you can. I don't know who sends me in the questions, I just answer them and everybody will see the questions and answers. They usually get sent out either the following week after the presentation. So let's get started. So uh, what I put up up top here is uh, to maintain uh, boiler efficiency and uh, we have a high efficiency uh, uh, boiler here. We're talking about 95% on uh, a boiler that uh, is in the millions of BTUs as well as the hundreds of thousands of BTUs and also as well as we're gonna talk about thermal efficiency here. So to maintain all that uh, thermal efficiency and as well as our annual uh, combustion uh, uh, efficiency, uh, we need to maintain the boiler uh, on an annual basis. And that's how we can get anybody's boiler to last longer as we all know that uh, maintenance on our car, uh, the, the, the boilers will last longer as well. <clears throat> and that's how we build a really good rapport with our customers as well. If we maintain them uh, and do the service on them, uh, they appreciate us a lot more, believe me. Uh, doing this for over 35 years, uh, I see it all and seen it all. Uh, and the next day you see more. So uh, starting with uh, just a little bit about the electrical power on this boiler, just for your information, it's 120 volts. Uh, and uh, if you had to do any testing. So I throw a little different things in here just to help along uh, to refresh our memories because uh, we've already installed the boiler. Now we're going out to, to do the maintenance on the boiler. Uh, and uh, with different boilers, uh, it's different voltages. So let's start uh, to uh, do the service and maintenance on this boiler here. We have to remove uh, the, the two front covers. On the smaller boilers, it's one uh, cover and one screw. So you're looking at a one screw right here, as well as one here. On the larger boilers, you're gonna have another door and you're gonna to have to remove that door as well. The other screw that you will have to take out is depending on which way your door is, uh, your burner is gonna swing, uh, left or right. You're gonna take that one screw out in that uh, corner or on the other corner and uh, lift that little side panel off. That way you can uh, swing the front door uh, of the burner open left or right. Just be aware that you can uh, have that uh, burner swing left or right by uh, changing the hinge to left or right on the smaller ones. And then on the larger ones, you would be switching your bolts uh, from left to right. To swing the doors open, we're gonna remove uh, the four, screw, uh, four bolts on the smaller one are in that uh, silver area here. And then on the larger ones, you'll see there's a larger bolt here. Uh, uh, with the smaller ones, it's actually the burner flange is uh, built right onto the burner. And then on the larger ones, you're actually putting your burner tube and your burner right through that uh, the door. So remember, you can swing it uh, one way or the other. 
And uh, depending on who ran the wires and how they're run, sometimes you might have to remove a couple of wires out of your burner control. Usually, uh, what I found, it's usually that 145 plug that's right on the top. Uh, when you come to the academy, you see uh, how we do it and uh, how you don't have to take any wires off if you uh, do it correctly and then wire tie it in such a way where you can swing the doors open without uh, removing wires. You will might have to uh, loosen the uh, worm screw on the uh, fresh air intake hose here as well so you can take that hose off so it allows the door to swing. Sometimes some guys will take this whole thing off because we're gonna, uh, further down, I'll show you that we might wanna inspect on the larger ones, uh, the rotary damper linkage and make sure everything's good with that. Just a part of your annual maintenance. It's, re it's better while you're there to take a look at everything, spend a little more time on there instead of ha having a large building or something go down in the middle of the winter. And now we're rushing out there to uh, fix something that we could have addressed uh, early on. Looking at the gas valve itself, uh, this is showing you uh, the uh, orifice change here, but on the uh, gas valve itself, uh, on the other side at the bottom here, there's an inlet gas valve uh, screen. Uh, and part of your maintenance uh, every now and then should be taking a look at that uh, gas inlet screen because that could uh, uh, hinder your performance of how much gas is coming in there. Uh, pipes can flake over time, dirt gets in pipes or even the oils from the uh, rotary meters uh, can work their way into that and uh, actually dry and get a little hard. So uh, being in tech support, this would be one thing I would recommend taking a look at is that uh, inlet gas screen. Things that we were gonna use or bring with us uh, to do our annual maintenance. I threw my uh, soot master vacuum in there, but it, uh, unless you have a sort of boiler, you really don't need a vacuum linkage to that nature. Uh, you could use a shop vac, but most of the stuff I've seen in the CM2 is like a white crusty material that you're normally going to take out uh, and uh, with a brush and then just vacuum out that dust. <clears throat> so soft bristle brushes, no steel brushes. Uh, we don't want to be scratching the stainless steel, even though with the uh, cleaning materials that we do recommend and the one that I've always used uh, since I've been uh, doing stainless steel boilers is the citrus syrup that's right out of our manual. Uh, I'm not sure you would have to call your supply houses to, in your area to see if it's ready, readily available. I have seen it online because uh, some of these videos, uh, uh, pictures that I did go uh, to get uh, were uh, online. And just follow their recommendations. The Antox 71E, I have not been able to find that here in the States. It's in our manual, but I, I believe that's a more of a European thing. Uh, so I would think uh, that might be for the Europe states. When I did look it up, I did find that it does come in a 55 uh, gallon drum as well as five gallon drum. So in concentrate, so you might buy, buy yourself a, a, an inexpensive uh, sprayer, uh, dilute it down and then uh, uh, you spray down the boiler before you uh, wash it down. So you would scrape all the stuff, vacuum it out not scrape it, but clean whatever's in there out. And then uh, the byproducts of unburned fuel. Vacuum it out and then uh, spray it with the citrus herb. What I like about it is it repacifies the metal. So once you clean it and uh, wash it down, uh, this uh, material here actually puts like a protective coat back on the metal. So if you did happen to scratch it, it yeah, it's kind of putting a protective coat on there. And, uh, it, and the stuff works really well. I was impressed with it. Uh, and, uh, it's in our manual. So after you do spray it down with your citrus syrup, you're gonna wash it out. And uh, as we all know, when we first get to the job, the first question uh, we're gonna get is, are you done yet? And we usually just carry in and our stuff and then, are you done yet? And my response is, uh, I just got here. So I just find it funny, you know, even on installations, so you're carrying your stuff in and 10 minutes later, they're asking, yeah, you're almost done. But it's a little process. You're gonna, you know, swing the door open. But uh, that's what I like about this boiler. As far as maintenance-wise, it's a very uh, easier for contracts to service the boiler. It comes right from the front. Most of all your service is done right out of the front of the boiler. Um, the only things you might have to get to the back of the boiler, maybe to check uh, your condensate uh, neutralizer, uh, which is at the back of the boiler. Uh, there's one uh, Luba door uh, that you can take off to access. 
and by uh, unscrewing the uh, cup on the very bottom. And by the way, this is a trap, so we do not want to double trap the boilers. I always like to throw that out there because what I've seen in tech support, uh, one of our biggest issues was double trapping or uh, not proper uh, piping for your uh, condensate. So here, we're just gonna unscrew that cap and all your stuff is gonna be in the bottom here. Uh, build up, you can take that, flush it out. Uh, uh, while you're flushing your boiler out, you might just take a little vinyl hose and run that to your uh, floor drain or whatever. And while you're washing it out, so you're not getting it all into your uh, your, your condensate uh, neutralizer. Uh, so that, that is a bob fitting. And, and by the way, if you, uh, want to go hard pipe with this here, just a little helpful hint that uh, you can actually take a piece of uh, half inch right, or three quarter rather and slide that right over there and it, the way it wedges right on there, there's not even any glue needed. Uh, it's the same one as the CU3A boiler, which is a residential boiler, uh, uh, same type of design. Some things I do forget, and this was one of the things from uh, the field techs out in the field that go out and take a look at some things here. And sometimes these are things that do not get addressed. It's like your little uh, P-traps on your, your uh, flue uh, pipes. These should be part of your maintenance as well as cleaning out those traps, make sure they're not clogged because if, if not, all your water gets all trapped up in here, trapped down inside here, and uh, it'll actually uh, put resistance on your fans. Uh, and doesn't matter whose boiler it is, but uh, when we get start to uh, fill up with water here, we're going to have uh, blockage or uh, slowing down our fan speed because we can't push through or a higher fan speed. The other thing we want to take a look at as part of our annual maintenance is take 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 a look at our neutralizing pellets. Uh, a lot of times we're going to find that they can get hot as a brick because sometimes uh, we're running at much higher temperatures so the boilers are not condensing as much or even when they are condensing this should be a part of uh, your annual maintenance replace or clean and uh, things that you can do is just check your pH levels going in and out and if we're in that seven or eight pH level that means we're good to go so if that means that you know the, the pellets are doing their job that they look clean uh, but uh, this one here, as you can see, what happens, I always uh, consider it to like a, a leach peel up in a, a septic system, uh, all the rocks and everything start to get clogged around the pellets themselves. And then the water can't get through those uh, limestones or the pellets itself. And then the water is just going to get a free ride right over the top and out. And then uh, you're not getting any neutralization. And uh, the, the, the tough thing with this stuff is it will eat your floor drains out. I've seen it, it will, uh, I've seen it etch uh, drains into the cement and make their own uh, gutters. Uh, so it gets acidic uh, as well. Uh, so this should be part of your annual maintenance and uh, you know, depending on what you're gonna charge a, a business uh, operation. Uh, it, sometimes we open up that front of that door and it's spotless inside, but this is stuff that you can address as well. And the other things I always used to tell employees uh, was take a look at the big picture, not just the boiler itself, but take a look at your pumps and your, your high vents and every, everything on the boiler itself or attached to the boiler because this is preventive maintenance. Uh, and, <clears throat> and as we know, some people want to uh, be preventive maintenance because they don't want to have it breaking down. They'd rather pay up front and get it fixed, uh, unlike some other people that would rather just let it fall into the ground and then replace it when everything's uh, leaking and falling apart. The burner tube itself, uh, you might want to do this not every year, uh, but every, uh, I recommend uh, if you're not using any uh, type of filtration system on your fresh air intake, maybe to do it every year because uh, these uh, burners, uh, the, the fresh air gets uh, brought right to the burner itself. So if you're taking fresh air from outside with no filters, uh, you can work bugs into this. So you can work a lot of different things inside these uh, screens. And uh, really, all you really need is compressed air. Uh, one of the field techs I have a, a video on uh, the CA3. It shows them using a little uh, mini leap blow, and it worked pretty well. So I, I, I saw it. I chuckled a little bit at it. And uh, it's a pretty small one, but it, it did blow all the dust and the dirt out. And uh, just remember what we're sucking in. It could be. Uh, 
uh, mulch piles out there or dirt, whatever it may be, but uh, it's only four screws and you can get them from the outside of the, the, uh, the burner. You pop the four uh, uh, nuts off and you can pull that burner right out through the front of it uh, once you have the door open uh, right through uh, the inside of the uh, front. What we do not want to do is remove the mesh off the burner tube and clean it because that was just a very costly mistake. Uh, this one here was uh, cut off uh, to, uh, it must have took a little bit of while to cut that mesh off because it's actually tack welded all the way around. Uh, but it looks pretty clean now. So we're not gonna remove the mesh, just the burner tube. And uh, the four nuts are on the other side of this, uh, on the outside of the uh, burner. You take the four nuts off and then you can slide this burner right out. Burner tube, I'm sorry. Once we open up the door and see there's the cylinder there, uh, this one here happens to be a, a smaller size. With a fine bristle brush, we can clean that mesh. We can clean the uh, ignition electrodes as well, as well as the ionization electrodes. Um, me, I, I inspect them. If they look pretty good, uh, you might get another year out of them, or if uh, you want to just uh, replace them, uh, now would be the time to replace them so you can check your gaps once you replace them. On the smaller one, this happens to be the smaller burner. The ionization electrode is a loop electrode. So I always like to point that out because uh, you're gonna take the J-cap nut off on the other side of the thing. So here it is taking a look at it. So now you can see you cannot pull that electrode from the out, uh, outside of the burner. And this is on the smaller burners. The larger ones you can pull right out from the front. But on this one model here, you have to take the little uh, fitting off the front, which is uh, this little, uh, fitting here. Uh, I used to call them Raja fittings. I'm not sure if they're still called that, uh, but uh, you just unscrew this. Once you unscrew that, there's a little rubber O-ring on there as well. So make sure that you don't lose it if you're gonna replace it uh, or uh, clean it. Um, if you're gonna reuse it, uh, make sure you don't lose the O-ring. So once you take that off and then you can reach on the, uh, swing the door open and then that will slide out and then you can uh, replace it or clean it. Uh, to replace it, there's going to be uh, two five millimeter um, Allen wrenches, uh, uh, screws in the front here. As you can see, there's one right here. And then you can pull out the porcelains uh, after you pull out that loop fitting. It shows you in the manual. So I cut this out of the manual just to show you how it, it's done. So it does show you in the manual. So make sure you don't run into that and try to pull it out through the front because as you know, that you're not gonna pull that loop through that um, burner plate. So it's in the manual, shows you how to take that nut in the washer and make sure you put it aside or if you're gonna replace it, uh, you can throw them away. Check in your gaps. Here's all your gaps and I just cut these pictures right out of the manual. So we're looking at the electrodes here. So as you can see, they have uh, between the two electrodes, one's a flame sensor and one's a igniter. And then it gives you all your millimeters. What I always like to point out is the, if you see a plus or a minus here, that says eight millimeters plus or minus one millimeter, forward or back. So if you're within that tolerance, you're good to go. Uh, if they're discolored, uh, normally just a fine toothbrush uh, or uh, what I always found worked the best and nothing really gritty, uh, a dollar bill or you know uh, something fine to that nature, something very fine. Because you really don't wanna scrub on that too hard because if you go and scrub it, you take the protective coat off it and then you go there the following year, it looks like barnacles hanging from it. So if anything, I would just replace them um, at the cost they are and uh, being uh, commercial applications, uh, it, it's probably quicker and easier just to replace. Checking your gap. So this is the other ones here, just showing you how to uh, check them, what your millimeters are. And, and like I said, this is uh, just me cutting this right out of the uh, manual itself. Uh, so this all in the manual. And by the way, if you uh, haven't been to our pro login, uh, when you go to our Academy website, uh, go and look up in the menu and see pro resources, click on that. And then you can access uh, Pro Resources. It has all our current manuals, historic manuals, 
as well as the fault code checker. And the fault code checker is pretty neat as well. I'll go over that a little bit uh, later on. On the larger ones, you can see that the flame sensor here is a straight flame sensor. So that means you don't have to open up the burner to take this one out. You can take the two five millimeter screws out from the front and pull this flame sensor right out. Just showing you uh, the newer one here, uh, had a little piece on there because with this burner here, as you can see, they lay sideways uh, and the heat from the mesh was actually making the flame sensor bend a little bit. And uh, so they, their fix was to tack that little piece on there and the issue uh, went away. So now you can see all your different uh, millimeter settings. And just remember that plus or minus gives you a little bit of tolerance in there as well. I find them to be a pretty uh, uh, longer lasting uh, than a, a year maintenance type thing, uh, unless you're getting pitting on them. And that could be from uh, improper air coming into the building or moisture. Uh, so it's not always about the electrodes, it's uh, what's going on in while we're burning. So I'll slow down a little bit here and uh, hopefully I'm keeping everybody awake right now. Uh, but uh, if you want to take a quick snapshot, here's your uh, uh, ignition electrode part numbers. As well as I put the uh, neutralization granulate there that comes in, a, I think, a 31, yeah, 31 pound bag. Uh, so if you want to buy that as well, we do sell it. We sell the electrodes. Um, so these would be a common uh, replacement pots as far as what I see as far as on this burner, your electrodes, your flame sensors. Uh, and then we'll get into checking safeties as well. <clears throat> and it's nice to see all the states starting to open up. Uh, I could tell things have started to change because I've been trying to get out of this business for the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years. And uh, my phone started ringing a couple of weeks ago again. Uh, so people are starting to uh, start to think about air conditioning and heating again. So uh, hopefully with these restrictions starting to lift, uh, people can start to get out there. I know uh, being a technician, uh, it's never a good time uh, for us because we're always out there fixing somebody's uh, heating system. Uh, and that, that was done uh, uh, quite a bit. So at this point here, we're about the midway uh, point. So if you have any questions, you can put them in now. And remember, if you think of some questions later on, uh, at the end, we'll have more questions uh, you can uh, write in and then uh, you can always write in at uh, any time uh, for questions. All right, we do have one question, Jay. Can you wash the burner with water? That's a great question. Right now, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're doing research on that. I, I recommend if you're going to do that, and I do go over that while we uh, are doing our hands-on training. Uh, with this burner here, you want to make sure that it's completely dry. If you don't, if you have a little bit of water on that underneath that burner mesh and you fire this burner, it's going to boil to steam and pop that mesh right off. So you got to make sure that it's completely dry. So if you do wash it, which is not a bad idea, in some cases, you're going to get cement dust in there that gets pretty you know, hard to blow out. Um, so I have seen it done. I have talked to the field technicians as well. And in some uh, situations, uh, they're thousands of miles from any part. So um, uh, to get things running, um, they, you know, they have to do what they have to do. But in that situation, uh, once you uh, think it's completely dry, then put it back in. And then uh, what you could do is pull that 145 communication plug off the, uh, the fan itself which will call on the, uh, the blower and then let it run and run and then double check and make sure that that's completely dry because that can be a costly error uh, replacing that burner tube. So just yeah, if, uh, make sure that it's completely dry. That's all I can say on that subject there. All right, that's the only question that came in, Jay, if you'd like to continue on. All right, great questions. Remember, make sure you uh, get your questions answered. That's what we're here for. And uh, we have all types of people in our building that can help me as if I can't figure it out. But uh, these are uh, points that uh, 
if you do find things. And, and this is uh, one thing that I, I do talk about during the installation as well is that when you first install this boiler, you can actually get a, a flame uh, ionization current reading. So on your very first inst install, you can go in there, get your flame sensor reading, and then write that on your startup report. So when you come the following year to do an annual maintenance, you can compare what your ionization current's reading the following year. So that way you might save a little time on uh, A, if it's reading pretty close to what it was the following year, you know you're, you're looking pretty good. And how to display that ironization current uh, is done. Uh, it's a quick little video just to show you how to do it. And this is in the manual as well. And uh, normally uh, when you come in, we do a, do this as well, as well as I give you a little cheat sheet that uh, we pass out to show you all these little neat little tricks on the burner control itself. So it's pretty quick to do. And uh, when you're reading that, that, that 14, that's 14,600. There's no decimal point there, just, just to let you know. But it's a neat little trick. So if you want to save your time or if you want to just uh, look at it uh, once you put it in, the new one in, uh, you can take a quick little snapshot of it and, and it, it will keep reading. It, uh, and as it heats up, it, 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 the, the signal gets stronger as well. Other things that you might want to consider taking a look at, and uh, you know, these are part of your safeties, and um, might be your relief valve. Make sure it's not dripping. Low water cutoff. Make sure that uh, you know most of them today have the manual test switch, so it's just a matter of pushing that switch and making sure it's working. I know with the old flow type uh, by law, and uh, not a lot of people know that, but uh, to properly. Uh, check those, you have to maintain them during annual maintenance. You have to totally take the float out, clean the float, and then put it all back together. That's what they consider uh, annual maintenance. Uh, same with these here. Every now and then you want to take your, um, your rod that goes inside the water out, make sure that it's not pitted and it's not uh, starting to uh, break down because they will over time. The other challenge is, uh, uh, Flow vents, uh, high vents. Uh, those uh, sometimes it's just a matter of unscrewing the cap on the top and wiping the scum out on the inside. I don't know. I don't care whose it is. A lot of times the floats just stick to the side because they get scummy inside them, and it's uh, from the water quality sometimes. And so that could be part of your annual maintenance as well. As well as take taking a look at your safety temperatures. Make sure they didn't come out of the uh, aquastat wells as well. Uh, I, and make sure all your clips are on. But all those safeties are in one pipe at the very top in your safety header, so it should be pretty quick and visually checked. The other thing uh, we do offer this in our installation manual is uh, we uh, offer how to build a filter rack, and this should be taken uh, a, a, a look at more often than a normal service maintenance. So uh, a lot of times uh, what I tell people is you can buy those little cheap uh, gauges that you drill a little hole in there. They're, they're only like five or $10 and it says green, red, yellow. And it's just that the filter's getting clogged. And uh, the maintenance person can be walking by and taking a look at that. So on a, a regular basis, they can take and uh, clean the air filter on this. And I, I've talked to a lot of the field techs and they recommend uh, putting uh, air filtration on this, uh, seeing the different things that are being um, sucked in through these fresh air kits. Uh, or dampers. Water quality is another different thing that you might want to take a look at as far as your water quality. Uh, just make sure you're uh, meeting our standards as pH or if we're treating the water. And if we have any type of antifreeze, we want to make sure that uh, we're staying in the pH levels. 
uh, because antifreeze could be very harmful to your piping as well once it gets very acidic. Uh, so that should be a, a simple test strip, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry about that, my voice is drying out. But if uh, you have any doubt, you can always call Beesman or uh, your, your reps and talk to them about uh, water quality. Other things that we may consider is uh, taking a look at your flue collector at the very back. If it's easy access to get the flue pipe off, you can take a look at your flue collector. And right below that is your um, your trap for your condensate uh, trap. In the back there is also your 15A, 15B flue temperature sensor. You can take a quick look at those, make sure that they're still uh, fine. On the main control on the boiler, a lot of people don't know this, but we do have an override test switch on there. So if you want to do your combustion test and you flip your uh, override switch, uh, it will run up to limit. And then you can do your combustion test doing that. And here's your override button here on the top. Just remember it, uh, that can also get you through a jam through the night if there's something wrong with the uh, control or something uh, where something's not uh, programmed correctly. You can hit that override and, and the boiler will run to limit uh, until you can get there. Just remember, don't shut the cover because on the cover itself, it will automatically shut that back off. There's a little uh, nib that sticks on the cover. So for the people that did do the test or they, if they did forget, when they close the cover, it will shut off that override test switch. <clears throat> On the burner control itself, all our safeties usually go to the burner control and then communicate to the boiler control. Just so it, um, if you want to check out any of them, uh, you can go through your test and then uh, do readings on your um, your boiler control to see what temperatures are. Just a little refresher. And this is what I was talking about, making sure that your uh, number three sensor, which is two of sensors inside here, are inside the well correctly and make sure that nobody pulled it out. Uh, I've had people actually take mine out and stick it in uh, insulation as a, a joke uh, for me and then see my boiler run uh, past limit. Uh, so there is normally a little clip in there that locks that uh, number three sensor in there. And uh, normally I just, uh, you can take a look at that or just taking a look at uh, your sensors themselves and make sure there's no frayed wires or anything to that nature. Just things to make sure that uh, nothing's going on with the boiler. Remember this is all preventive maintenance. Uh, so here's where all your sensors would normally go. So your, your 3A and your 3B uh, in the burn, near the burner control, your 15A, your 15B, which is, remember that flu, uh, flu temperature sensors that go to the back of the boiler themselves. Uh, power uh, is coming up here. Remember I put up the 120 volts coming, uh, so the power is coming always to any of our burners, oil, gas, uh, and since I've been putting them in for 30 years, the power plug has always been the 40 plug. <clears throat> if you do want to take a look at your servo motors and your, uh, your damper, uh, these are enrichment dampers. So this is for uh, startup of the, uh, the burner. If you want to take a look at those, you do have to pull the black cover off here. Uh, there's about uh, eight uh, screws, you take that off and then just uh, check for wear and tear on your, your knuckles and uh, the, the servo motor is uh, right here. Just, just things to look at and to consider. It's not that you have to do this every time, but over time things uh, get worn and torn. And uh, you cannot see this uh, pin here because it is uh, behind the cover, not that it is a problem. 
Uh, but as far as maintenance wise, every now and then uh, you might want to just take a quick look at it. And just to show you what it does when it starts. So th the only time this opens and closes is during uh, the initial startup. So it's going to fire now, it closes. It fired and it opens back up. It's the only time uh, that opens and closes. So as you can see, if you have that little black uh, cover on, you're not gonna be able to see that uh, operation. Once you did uh, disconnect your gas, because uh, to swing this uh, burner open, you have to disconnect your union. And on this one here, the union's actually uh, at the bottom here on this boiler here. This is the one at our office here. So uh, we would uh, disconnect that union once you shut off your main gas, uh, which is on our boilers out here. And then we do ship out the gas valve as well uh, here. But once you disconnect that union and you, after you're done cleaning, uh, it's a possibility you may have to, and most likely you're gonna have to reset the low gas pressure switch that's shipped out with the boiler, depending on where they put it. This one here happens to be inside the cabinet right before the burner. There's a little black switch right here. You push that after you turn on your gas and then reset the gas pressure switch. I, I just threw this because uh, that, you know, as a reminder, some uh, on, on the orifice house, but not in programming. So uh, for LPG uh, programming, it's done on the burner control itself. And this is just a very quick video and shows how it's done. Just uh, as refreshes, or if you get to a job and you find it to be uh, pretty dirty because they didn't switch it over. It's just a matter of uh, hitting a couple of buttons up and down. And by the way, you can see all this when you first, the, uh, you'll see them hit the reset button here. And that's just to get the burner to refire. But when you watch here after that 12 disappears, you're gonna see that it's gonna be at 100% uh, of its firing rate. We're on LPG now, and we're at low altitude. Uh, so that's uh, changes that have been done right on the burner control. So when you first get there and uh, uh, you wanna see, make sure everything's been set up correctly, you can fire up the boiler and just take a quick look at the burner control itself. And then that will tell you that uh, everything's set up right or if anybody has touched your modulation. So as you saw, when it first fired off, it was at 100%. You can change that, say uh, the gas piping was done uh, too small and somebody went back there and decreased your firing rate there uh, at, instead of 100%, say they brought it down to 75%. When this burner first fires up, if anybody made that adjustment on uh, from 100% to 75%, you're gonna see that right in the beginning of this boiler firing up. So it's gonna say, hey, I'm at 75%, I am on natural gas and I'm at high altitude or low altitude. Uh, so that's just a quick way of checking the uh, reason why I bring this up is, uh, and because I had mentioned earlier, check your gas inlet uh, screen. Uh, if that gas inlet screen is not meeting uh, uh, partially clogged, you're not gonna get these readings. And these are the readings that we wanna see when we're throwing our manometer on here, checking to make sure they're getting the right gas pressures. The other thing that sometimes gets uh, left out is there is a low gas pressure switch on the gas valve itself uh, and it's set for natural gas to four. So if you ever run onto one where it's set to four and they're running on propane, they got lucky that it ran. Uh, but if you uh, went out on a service call and it's not, uh, and they just installed it, that has to be switched to our, uh, to nine inches of water column instead of four inches of water column. Just a little helpful hint there. To make your high and low gas fire adjustments, on uh, the left-hand side, you can see there's a large uh, cap uh, and uh, you, you pop that blue cap off that there. And that's where you're gonna make your high fire adjustments. 
the field technicians out that I talk to I always highly recommend uh, adjusting your high fire first and then go to your low fire. And uh, you can go from 100%. Uh, this one here just shows you how to go, uh, how to do it. But you can reduce this and uh, to go down to low fire, it's gonna go down to zero. So when you see him here, he only goes down to a certain percentage. But when you wanna do low fire testing, you're gonna go down uh, and bring it down all the way to zero. And zero is low fire. And with this boiler here, when you get down to zero, it's really hard to tell that the boiler's running. You really gotta, either take a look in the site door or really listen closely. So now he's dropping it down. He's only dropping it down, I believe, to 75% um, for this showing. But if you wanted to go all the way down to low fire, you would drop that 75 all the way down to zeros. That's low fire with this boiler. So high fire is 100%, low fire is at zero. But now he just restarted the boiler. You could see that he was at 74%. It was on natural gas and at low altitude. So here, uh, making your adjustments to make sure that we're reading uh, and trying to get into a, at low, uh, low or high fire. Uh, we want to get into uh, our CO2 range of about 8.5 to 9.5. As long as you're within that range, you're good to go. With propane, we're looking at that 10 uh, to 11% on high fire. Uh, and you're gonna make your uh, high fire adjustments with the larger cap. <clears throat> and as you can see in small increments, uh, you can either use a torque or a three millimeter Allen wrench that goes right inside here. And then uh, we're gonna have our analyzer in the boiler, making sure that our CO2s are correct and uh, while we're making these adjustments. So make small adjustments, take a look at your analyzer. Low fire, we're gonna pop the little screw off the cap here. It's a little screw uh, cap. You pop that off and that's definitely gonna be a torque, a 40 millimeter torque there. And, uh, and that's where you're gonna make your adjustments for low fire. Same thing on natural gas on high fire, 8.5 to 9.5 on uh, natural gas, 10.0 to 11.0 on propane, and then low fire uh, uh, natural gas, 8.0 to 9.0 and propane, 9.5 to 10.5. As long as you're within that range, you're good to go uh, on this uh, adjustments. We have it, you can also do a, a, a visual, uh, not that you can see much with this, you'll see a glow in there. Uh, but uh, like I said, when you're on low fire, it's uh, really hard to tell that this boiler is running. I've uh, had many, many classes when they're asking me when I'm gonna fire the boiler and it's been running the whole time. And that's with the cover off. So it's very uh, quiet boiler. This is a nice little video just to see uh, what uh, we're looking at uh, once we've done uh, doing our service and maintenance. I wouldn't recommend having the door open to do this. But it's just uh, just to show you what you're looking at. As a contractor, I just thought it was pretty cool. You can see the flame operation. You can see your flame sensor operation and it'll modulate it up and down. You don't get a really big flame. It's not a gigantic flame like uh, when I first started in the industry. I, you know, some flames were 15 feet long coming out of some of the burners that I worked on. And now you see these uh, 2.5 million BTUs and the flame gets, you know, couple inches off the burner. So now we've gone a long ways as far as technology goes, uh, sizes of boilers. With the holes now and not uh, spinning the, the fireboxes inside them because I was the uh, the guy that can actually fit inside them. Not anymore though. After this uh, 
coronavirus, uh, I lost a lot of weight, put it back on, and hopefully I'm starting to lose it again. <laughs> but uh, so things that you can do right out of the burner control. Remember, we can do a high, uh, low fire test uh, uh, by hitting that S arrow, uh, and then uh, decreasing it from 100% down to 0% on that. Uh, we can see our fault alarms on this boiler. We can see our burner operation, maintenance, our faults, all are done on this burner control here. And like I was talking about earlier, there might be some plugs that you might have to unplug off this to swing that door open. But uh, no panic on our, our boilers, all our uh, wires are numbered and you can only get them into the right spot. So if you look down here, the plugs are numbered as well as the, the uh, places where the plugs have to go. So if you had to unplug them all, not a big deal. My uh, computer froze up. So that's a, a little bit about the, the maintenance of the CM2 here. Uh, as we get to the larger and smaller boilers, is a little uh, larger, uh, they get longer. Um, so they're still I, what I find to be one of the easiest boilers out there to service and maintain. And that's what I've always liked about uh, Beesman. They always kept the contractor in mind. Uh, maybe not in the beginning with their control platform. Uh, you had to be, you know, an engineer to do their controls, but the controls are, uh, and by the way, we'll be having control classes coming up uh, uh, in the near future as well as other seminars, uh, but uh, webinars, I'm sorry. But uh, they have made the control a lot more easier and contractor friendly. Uh, from what I found over the years as well. Uh, when I first started, the uh, controls were uh, pretty difficult, but uh, now they have the startup wizards on there that help you walk yourself right through uh, initial startups. And uh, really what you need to know is uh, what the boiler is doing and uh, how to test things. Uh, so that's part of another class itself, but uh, this was the service and maintenance part of the class. And uh, Part of your service and maintenance, uh, you might have to call tech support at one point uh, to ask them for parts or uh, whatever it may be. Here's some helpful things for tech support. They have made some changes and long strides since I've been in there. As well, when I first started in tech support, they started at 8.30. Uh, I was the, an older gentleman that liked to come into work earlier, so they actually started at uh, uh, seven o'clock. So now we have tech support from seven uh, to five uh, in summer hours. And then uh, in winter hours, it goes from seven uh, in the morning uh, uh, Eastern time uh, to eight o'clock Eastern time. But they did have somebody this year in the Midwest helping us out uh, who was a former uh, technician, uh, uh, part-time retired and uh, he was helping us out as well. So now you can see this here. This, uh, if you wanna see any part of this uh, video, like Miranda was showing you earlier, if you wanna come back to any of this stuff or see any of it the, as a refresher, it's gonna be on our uh, uh, Academy website as well. So hopefully we saw the needs and uh, why we should be doing annual maintenance. Uh, it's to keep our cup, uh, customers happy as well as our, our owners happy. You know, we're making money, we're doing uh, justice for the, the business owner as well as maintaining their uh, units uh, for years of uh, life as well as we need to get paid to do these jobs as well. So it, um, it keeps everybody moving. Hopefully you saw the cleaning solutions, the proper tools, remember no steel brushes, uh, no scraping tools, uh, you're gonna find that uh, that sister surf works really well. And uh, like I said, it does put a protective coating on there. Uh, so it's a, it, the stuff does work. Uh, and I've used it as well for many years. You went over all your different steps. Uh, hopefully Homer uh, showed you how to wash the boiler out. And uh, sometimes we've got to put our earplugs in to say, hey, we've just got here, we're still working. So at this point here, we're 
about at the end uh, for uh, uh, the presentation. I know it's a quick one, but uh, as you can see, uh, they make it fairly simple to service these boilers. Uh, troubleshooting is uh, not much different on these boilers because you can see everything's easy to access. As well, even on, you know, our, our wall hung boilers, you can do rack systems as far as, that. even those I find would be a lot easier and uh, service friendly. Uh, and I have serviced pretty much everybody's boiler out there. So that's what I always brought me back was the quality as well as the ease of service. All right, we have one question in here. When using the air filter on the intake, what is the length restriction factor for venting system? Yeah, the venting, uh, as far as that goes, it's in that, uh, I actually, I had it in there um, and I took it out yesterday. Um, so when I answer your question, I'll, I'll, I'll attach that information uh, for you on there because it's a little lengthy. But uh, as far as your length, it, 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 uh, I believe the filter size that they give you in that um, filter rack, rack system is like a 25 by or 25 by 25 or 20 by 25 filter. <clears throat> and they do part of the uh, calculations for you as well. So. All right, that is the only question we have, Jay. Well, those were good questions anyways, and I appreciate everybody spending the time. I know it's a quicker presentation than uh, normal, but uh, as you can see, there's not a heck of a lot to do these. And, and the final thing that I always say is uh, the last thing any business owner or homeowner ever sees uh, on the annual maintenance that we do provide is how you wipe off the boiler itself on the outside. You could do hours and hours of maintenance inside the boiler. And the only thing they're ever going to see is how you wiped off the top of the boil. So just a little, you know, comment that, that I always used to get was, boy, the outside of the boiler looks great. And I'm like, well, you could have spent the other three hours here watching me do the inside of the boiler. And uh, it, as my face would be black and my hands would be black. But thanks again for everybody for joining us. I appreciate you giving up the time and uh, make sure you look for our, our, uh, CA3 presentation on uh, service and maintenance is coming up, uh, I believe, next week, uh, right, Miranda? Two weeks from today, Jay. Two weeks, I'm sorry. See, I'm losing track of my days and weeks and mm -hmm. times, and so I apologize for that. And uh, I keep Miranda on her toes because she's constantly correcting me. So, <laughs> thanks, Miranda, and I appreciate everybody uh, for showing up. Thank you, Jay. Before we close out, just a few reminders. As stated, this will be in the video library on that Academy website within the next two weeks, so you will be able to go rewatch that at that time. If you think of additional questions, feel free to email me. Uh, we will be putting together a document of all the questions and the answers, and we will get the answers to that last question that was asked today, and it will be in that document. And we will send that to, out to everyone who attended today. Lastly, we do, like Jay said, have the CA3B service and maintenance webinar coming up in two weeks. Next week, we have an air elimination webinar, and then the following week as well, a boiler control strategies webinar. So feel free to go register for those at any time. Uh, with that being said, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>